Uh, I will start by saying just a few words about uh, myself. I'm Swedish. Uh, I was born in 58. Uh, I studied mathematics and physics, so I have a technical background. But I've spent uh, uh, my whole life so far being a serial entrepreneur. I started businesses in IT, real estate, and banking. And I consider myself both a bit of a thinker, but m most of all a practical person wanting to create uh, projects and uh, be a source of change in society. Uh, my ma main business has been banking. So uh, I was the chairman of uh, EFG Investment Bank in Stockholm, Oslo and Helsinki during 2000 to 2006. Uh, having my main residence in Geneva and then in London, I still live in London. But from 2008, my main interest has been in my own foundation that I founded after uh, I sold my banking operation. So in 2008, I created the Air Credit Foundation or the Oak Island Foundation, which is a literal translation of, of the name. And uh, the Oak mm -hmm. Island Foundation is, is centered around the Oak Island on which we have our own conference uh, facility, so my foundation owns the island, and uh, we try to bring groups there to uh, do essentially three, three things. One is just like yourself, being a think tank, thinking about uh, the big social complex issues of our society today, but also in various forms, both when it comes to uh, personal development, and especially when looking at the development of consciousness. We have retreats and group activities where we're actually trying to implement the latest thinking in developmental psychology in, in group works. And we are also doing the same thing when it comes to social entrepreneurs. We are bringing groups out there trying to stimulate and facilitate uh, uh, social entrepreneurs to bring about change in society. I think I said that. Uh, we could say that, our spe uh, that we are especially interested in looking at the co-evolution of personal development and social development. Um, and to look at both our individual and our collective ability to handle complexity. And I think this last uh, part uh, very much coincides with, with, with your approach. Uh, I think that all of those problems that were listed here er earlier, one could say in some respect uh, stems from the fact that we have today developed our ability to individually handle complexity in a much, much larger way than we have handled our, uh, developed our collective ability to handle complexity. And that is what I think we, we, we need today as a collective. We need to increase our ability to handle complexity. So our collective ability to, to, to handle complexity. Uh, but I, I couldn't stress enough that we are actually a very practical organization foundation. We work a lot with adolescents, with youth camps trying to develop complexity. We work with uh, uh, think tanks and organizations in, in Sweden. Here is Anders Wikman, of course, up in our tower at the island. And then courses when it comes to personal development, social entrepreneurs, and, and all, of, all of those things. Um, <coughs> when it comes to handling uh, collective complexity and also looking at societies and the evolution of values in society, I'm, I'm sure that you're all familiar with this uh, diagram. It's the World, Wild, World Value Studies diagram that on uh, this axis lists the sort of traditional values or secular rational values and on this uh, axis lists survival values and self-exploration values and this diagram explains a little bit why I am so interested in the Swedish uh, culture and the Scandinavian culture and why I have my foundation in Stockholm even though I, I live in London and that is of course because I think there's something very interesting going on in these cultures that 
Sweden is really an outlayer up here in this diagram. And as if you, this is a study that's done every 50 years and it's been going on for 25 years. And you can really see that all countries, wherever they come from, is sort of moving up towards this, this area up there. But then, um, so that, that is one conclusion from this diagram. But then also this diagram, I think, is a little bit uh, limiting our way of thinking because somehow it looks like Sweden, uh, here we have arrived at sort of the top of development. We are up at the corner there. But that is, of course, not the, the case. Uh, a better way of looking at it is to shrink this whole value spectrum down to, to, to the corner and to say, well, if we are looking outside this box, what would be the future the development on these two different uh, uh, axes? And if we then take away this box, all of a sudden, I mean, we, we see the, the, the full potential of development that could take place. And we really say that our challenge at the Oak Island Foundation is to try to move society, starting with Sweden, trying to shift it out of this corner and, and to, to evolve our values. And what do we think that evolution could be all about? Well, on this ax axis, we believe that we are moving from traditional values to secular rational values, that, but that we now need to move beyond a secular rational worldview to some sort of, call it holistic worldview or integral worldview or, or uh, some way where we can transcend the strict Newtonian models of the rational, secular, and to take in more aspects of, of, our, of ways of understanding. And in the same way, on the other axis, we've been moving from materialistic values to self-expression values, and I believe that the next step there would be to move more towards self-transcendence values. And I could say that we, that we see both of these tendencies in the Scandinavian markets, not so much in our general culture, but of course in, in individuals, and especially in young individuals, sort of uh, uh, 25, 30, 35. They are definitely moving into these two uh, areas. So um, uh, one could say, is it then possible to, to break out of, of this uh, box? Uh, well, if you look at this little box in, this is the value space of our medieval society. This is uh, where we had all our different medieval societies and through the enlightenment, of course, that was all about breaking outside of this box and, and moving up here. So we've done this before, and we now need to break the box again. So that is, that, and that is really the mission of our foundation. It's trying to break out of this box and move outside the secular rational worldview and the um, focus on us as self-expression individuals. Um, other projects that I'm involved in is, of course, the Club of Rome. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in uh, setting up an institute in London called the Mind and Society Institute, together with Jonathan Rosen, uh, who's just left the RSA to do this. Um, in Stockholm, we are in the process of setting up a new foundation together with the Karolinska Institute, looking to take the latest neuroscience development into rethinking, reinventing learning. And I saw on your agenda that you have reinventing education there. And I think one might even need to rethink the framework of education. Um, where is the place in education tomorrow in our lifelong learning process? So that could also be of interest for cooperation. And then, of course, uh, where we started talking that my, my book, The Market Myth, that I expect to be out uh, in three, three to six months. So just staying a little bit on, on, on that book, and as you can see from, from my presentation, this is not really my major interest today. 
yeah, this is just my background. I come from the market background. I've been working inside the, the market, and I, and I could not the 20 years I worked inside the market to, to, to think about the market more as a sociologist as well as, a, as an uh, economist. So this is not my main interest, but it's an interesting um, entrance to thinking about all of these uh, problems and especially thinking about how we, how we need to think in more complex terms about our social issues. Um, so this is an illustration that, that I have in the book that summarizes a bit uh, my thinking about the market and the market myth. And we have some sort of concept, an idea about the market, which I call a myth, because we, we all, and especially most economists, really know that the general impression and idea we have of the market is, is not true. Uh, and I try to analyze where, where does this myth come from. And one of the, my major arguments is, of course, that the, that the neoclassical model uh, of the market has got such a prominent place in our thinking about the market that it really hides from our view the, the, the real, much more complex prevailing market. And uh, my book explains in a little bit wh where did this model come from, why is it good, where, where are the limitations of the models, and uh, how can we use the model but still have a more realistic view about the market. So the model hides the prevailing market, but then perhaps even more importantly, the prevailing market, which is a result of a, l go a little bit through uh, in the book, that really in, it, in its turn, hides the fact that there are a number of equally free possible markets. Because, of course, as we've said a few times, this prevailing market, uh, even though we might simplistically take it as a natural phenomenon, of course it's not. It is man-made and it, and it is a, uh, a human construct. Um, so, um, uh, to summarize my thesis there, it is that the market is an open, complex, adaptive system, uh, mm -hmm. and that already Adam Smith, of course, understood this on some intuitive level, um, but that during the 1990s we tried uh, to model this complex system using Newtonian mathematics, and of course, in building this simplistic model of the complex market, a lot of insights got, got lost. Um, and that we started to believe uh, in these crude assumptions that we had to make in order to, to make the mathematic of the model work. And we started to believe that there, these assumptions actually reflected reality in different ways. Um, and then perhaps again, the most important thing here, that in contrast uh, to many of the open, complex, adaptive systems we find in nature, uh, the, the market has got socially constructed feedback mechanisms and internal rules. And that it's very few today that really uh, understands the importance of this and the possibility that this creates uh, for us to choose what sort of free market we want to have, and that this is a potential for collective freedom that is largely completely uh, untapped today. So th th this is really the core message of, uh, of the book. And uh, again then, to, to, to really understand this, we are again back to our collective ability to handle complexity when we start to look at the market in this much, much more complex way and, and the fact that this way of looking at the market gives us some sort of collective freedom, how, should, how could that we have today to try to, to tap that potential of, of collective freedom? That is a, um, is a major problem. Um, and that we need to understand uh, the market and, of course, on an adequate level of complexity, recognizing both the fact that it is uh, 
that it has got a high technical complexity, that the market is a complex system and that it can't be modeled with equilibrium and mathematics. But perhaps more importantly, that it has this social uh, complexity that we mentioned a few times this, this morning. And that we need both to get a general understanding of this social complexity, but also find ways of handling this uh, complexity and the freedom that comes with it. Um, th that, that was a lot of, of uh, theory and, and abstract thinking, and I think my book is really about trying to, to ch not come with a lot of uh, recommendation on policy and what one could do and shouldn't do, even if I have a few of those things, but the main message is really having this paradigm <coughs> shift of how we see the market. And I, and I, I uh, actually call it the Copernican revolution of the way to see the market and the shift from having sort of the market in the center and us humans circulating around the market. It's again a question of putting us humans in the center of the system and understanding that the market is, is really there to, to service us. But to give one uh, uh, example, uh, about one practical example, uh, I will we'll end with one practical example. And, and that is that I find it very useful to use the American contemporary philosopher John Searle's distinction when he's talking about complex systems be, be, between the, um, uh, what he calls regulative rules and constitutive rules. So uh, any rules that regulates an already existing system he called regulative rules. And of course, we might need regulative rules. But the even more important thing is to realize that most systems, and especially socially constructed systems, wouldn't be systems without the constitutive rules. So for example, the game of chess wouldn't be a game of chess if we didn't have the rules of the game. And those rules, they define the game. So I think it, it's one step more complicated than you mentioned th this morning. It's not only that, that we can change the rules, the, the market has got at its core a number of rules, mainly property rules, but also contract rules. That wouldn't be a market. Of course, there could be a market in beaver skins. And 85% of everything traded are immaterial goods, copyrights, property rights, financial instruments, and, th and those are nothing but the const constitutive rules. And the fact that, that it's very important to get those constitutive rules right. And in the example of copyright, if we look at the copyright, of course copyrights are not given by God, they are a hum human human invention, and a quite simple thing. I mean, you can look at what can be copyrighted, how novel does a thing need to be able to be copyrighted. What I'm looking at here is just the parameter of the length of copyright. And if you look at the social good of copyright, it is, of course, to uh, stimu stimulate innovation. And those who created copyright knew, knew very well that the intention of copyright and patents was to stimulate innovation and to publish and that is to get things into the public domain as quick as possible for society to reuse. So probably the, um, a function of the social good, the collective good <coughs> of copyrights, looks like something like this. It certainly peaks somewhere before 25 years of, of, of length. That would give enough incentives for individuals and for corporations to create innovations. But anything longer than that, that would stifle reuse and re-innovation. Whereas the private profits of copyright, the constitutive rules, you have this trade-off. You had the trade-off between the common good and the uh, special interests that are arguing for a specific uh, format of these constitutive rules. So this is my final slide. So. Uh, uh, my conclusion is that we should then uh, carefully choose the internal constitutive rules of the market 
so that the markets pre-distribution that some people are talking about, that's the, that, that's the self-organizing effect of the market, as far as possible aligns with the common good of society and not with some special interest groups, uh, the way that it has, has historically most often been the case. And that um, once uh, we, through the constitutive rules, have created an efficient free market that self-organizes in a way that as far as possible aligns with the common good, then of course we, we still might need to do some regulating and some redistribution. But in the name of efficiency of the market, the more we can affect with the internal rules, the less we have to affect the efficiency of the market with external regulating rules. Thank you.